Okay. We're going to keep working here with our radicals and our exponents. And sort of like what we were just getting done kind of talking about. And again, this root number, sometimes it can be referred to as a root number. Mathematically, we like to refer to it as an index. And we can go back and forth between radicals and exponents. Now, we've talked about this one before, doing the exponent divided by the index or by the root. But I also can go from this back to the radical form, remembering that the exponent goes underneath with my whatever this happens to be. It may be a number. It may be a variable. It could be anything. And my root out here. So if we're asked to write something as a fractional exponent that's in a radical form, it's always going to be exponent over index. And I'm just making it an exponent. D to the 2 thirds. Nothing to solve. Just write it and I'm good to go. Now, if I ever get into one of these, though, where I can reduce the fraction, though, I do need to do that. So like, for instance, on 2, my exponent over index is 2 fourths, but we know we can reduce that. So we'd reduce that down to a half, and we'd be OK with that. Now, a lot of the time, it'll be real straightforward. I just do exponent over root or, root or exponent over index, and I'm fine with this. But other times, again, I've got to make sure 4 to the 4 would be just 10, or if you wanted to put 10 to the first, you could. But we start to get into some where there's more variable terms. Then it starts getting a little more interesting. You're like, well, do I just do it all in one big piece? No. I do each variable separately. So exponent over index. Now, what do I do about f? One, one, one third. Yep. Because we always assume there's an exponent of 1 on any variable if we don't see one. So you can have different exponents on these. That's not a bad thing. It's just something we got to kind of play with a little bit. Now, this gets a little more interesting. When I go to write as a radical, just keep reminding yourself it's exponent over root. Now, here at the start, we'll literally put the exponent and the root in, even though. If this were written in the back of your book, they'd just put the square root of 2 because we assume that exponents are 1 if we don't see 1. And we also assume that any root or index is 2 if I don't see a number there. But e either way, I'd accept either of those because they're both correct. So as we do those, again, exponent over index. And that's all I'm doing. It's just remembering how I can write this. So when it does come to numbers, I can start breaking these down. Now here, exponent over index, I would assume I can actually turn this into a value. 5 squared is 25. And I'd simplify it. So if we can, we should. Exponent over index or root. Let's see here. Exponent, I don't have to have it over root. But if I did have the 1 there with my 4, I could. OK, now, this next part. And I, I usually have a hard time talking students into this. But there will be another. There will be a method to this later on in the course where you'll be glad that you did this the right way. Because some of you are going to say, well, wait a minute. So evaluate expressions with rational exponents. OK, so what's this actually mean? Well, there's a couple of things I can do here. And you can pick which way you want to do it. But I'd like you to have both options available. Here, let's think about this a minute. If I'd written this in its radical form, let's think about that. So this would be 9 exponent Okay, index. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Could I write that as the square root of 9 to the third? And the answer is yes. My exponent doesn't always have to be stuck right in here. It could go like this. And you're like, oh, well, the square root of 9 is 2, and 2 to the third power is 8. But couldn't I, to be perfectly honest, 
why wouldn't I just go to my calculator and say, well, it's just nine to the three halves, and I got this, what did I just do? What silly thing that, oh, <gasps> what did I do? I see it now. There you go, my gosh, the square root of nine is two. What am I doing? It's Monday, okay. Calculator, good backup to make sure you don't do silly things like the teacher just did. Um, but again, you're like, why wouldn't I just want to do it in the calculator? Being able to manipulate these into radicals and then being able to change them around is a good thing to be able to do. It helps with number sense some. Now, I'm never going to sit there and say you have to do that. I'm just saying it can come in handy, especially if you start getting into some values Let's say like 12, for instance. This would probably be one I'd even be tempted to go to the calculator on. And I'd go and I'd get that typed in. Now, here's one thing, oops, one thing I am going to jump up and down and scream about. I do not want to see a decimal on these, okay? 0.25 is a fourth. If you need to use math, enter, enter, okay, I can live with that. But here's why I want you to think about these things for a minute. Typically, when you have a negative exponent, you're going to get a fractional answer because what that negative exponent's going to do, and we'll talk more about this as we move along, is it ends up taking your value and flipping it down to the denominator. Or if it was in the denominator, it flipped it back up. And then I could look at this and say, okay, my index or my root is 5. So I look at my, oh, get the calculator out of the way. I look at that and I say, okay, oh, fifth root of 32, that's what this would be, is 2 and 1 over 2 squared, which is my exponent, is 4. Again, for those of you that like to challenge yourselves, I think that's a good way to try and solve these because then you're making yourself think, you know, what should the answer be? Should it be bigger? Should it be smaller or whatever? But at least know that if you see a negative exponent, you're going to get a fractional answer. Because it's very easy to look at this and go, oh, it's the square root of 4. It's 2, which is true. Except remember, its exponent, which we took care of the exponent by flipping it down over root. What's the square root of 4? It's 2. But again, to keep some of you from panicking or freaking out here, no worries. If we go to the calculator on some of these, that's not a terrible thing. Five halves, it's positive still, so that's good. It means it's going to get larger. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the square root of 16, which would be 4, because that's my root. Then I'm doing that times the exponent. So 4 to the 5th, it'd be 1,024. And that's how we're going to do this, a negative exponent. Okay. Again, I know it's going to be a fractional answer. At least it should be if I didn't do something wrong here. So let's see. Negative 2 thirds. And again, no stinking decimals. Okay, that's better. Because again, I look at that and I'm like, the cube root of 27 is 3. 3 to the negative 2 means I flip it over. And 3 to the second power is 9. And that's where my answer came from the calculator. So I actually understand where the values are coming from. Not just plugging it in and writing down whatever the calculator says. Because as you saw earlier, I can either press or do something wrong and then I don't get the right answer and it's not good. Now, are there some places that using the calculator is appropriate? Absolutely. Here in the next part, use a graphing calculator to approximate. Round answers to the nearest hundredth. I don't know why it says use a graphing calculator, because I can do this without a graphing calculator. How am I going to write this in its exponent form so I can actually get it plugged into the calculator? What's this going to look like? 5 to the what power? You go exponent over root. Three-fourths. Three fourths. Okay. 
so we are going to do 5 to the 3 fourths. And here's the opportunity we get to go decimaling. Round your answer to the nearest hundredth, which again would be two decimal places. So here that three isn't going to let us go up anymore. So we've got 3.34. So the biggest thing here you've just got to remember is that it's exponent over root when you're typing them in. They are not interchangeable because if I go three-fourths instead, I get a completely different answer. So once I get number 17 typed in here, what's my final answer going to look like? Four point what? Three, three. three. Because again, the six is going to cause this number to round up. And those are the type things we're kind of playing with here. Now this last one, you're like, well, wait a minute. Looks like five to the three thirds. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you do something to the three thirds, you're basically just taking it to the first power. It's five. It'd be whatever's underneath because my root and my index would wipe each other out. So again, as we're doing these, and I'm not going to do a whole lot more here with some of them at the bottom until we get down to 29 because we get a lot of repetition. I don't want to go crazy with the repetition here. But again, when it goes to evaluate the expression, there's a couple of ways you can look at this. You can either look at it, if you're still going to one of these, that's the cube root of 8. Here's my cubes. Oh, the cube root of 8. My x value is 2. Okay. If you don't know your cubes at this point, again, you always can do exponent over index. And if you're not sure on one of those, I always can plug it into the calculator. Can do 8 to the 1 third okay. and get an answer that way. But what will seem to happen on a lot of these are you're going to find values that are going to be in the way of my calculator. Okay, there we go. Here's my fourth roots. Because again, if you're looking for these, these would be the ones that are in the four, the three, and so on. Oh, 81's right there. It's three. Okay. But again, otherwise you can do exponent over index in your calculator. And it'll work the same way. If it's already in that form, even better. Type in exactly what you've got. 64 to the 1 sixth. Get an answer out. So don't let the things throw you off. As long as you can get them into exponent form to be able to get into your calculator, you'll be able to evaluate them every time, you'll be happy as can be. Okay. We'll keep life simple. So you're like, okay, so what does this part have to do with what we're doing over on the back, since it seems like we're kind of doing this backwards. And we're not really doing it backwards. They, they do have enough separate points that it's, it's okay to go over some of these other things. But here's what we're going to do once we get to here. Lots of simplifying, lots of breaking down. And let's try to put this top part into English here a little bit. Basically what this says up here is, if both of your radicals have the same root, they have the same index, I can multiply or divide what's underneath them and then try to simplify it. For instance, here I may look at number 1 and I'd say, okay, I can't break down the 6 right now, Ooh, but I could break down the x squareds. But before you do that, let's see what happens if we multiply all the stuff underneath together because their roots are the same. 6 times 6 would be 36. And again, x squared and x squared is x to the fourth. And now I look at that and I go, oh, wait a minute. The square root of 36 is 6. And then, oh, that's right. I remember. My root out here is 2 if I don't see 1. 2 goes into 4 twice. Oh, it's like Friday. And I'm done. Except I'm putting 2 together and then reducing as much as I can. 
Same way in number two. Again, as long as that root is the same, we're OK to do this. So I multiply across 3 times 12 is 36. 4 and 3 is 7. Let's see here. OK, square root of 36 is 6. I like that part. What about my variable, though? How many full times does 2 go into 7? 3. Do I have any remainder left? How many? 1. OK. When I'm doing my long division, just keep reminding yourself. And if you need to do a little side work to remind yourself, that's OK. 2 goes into 7 3 times. That's going to be my exponent outside. And then if I have a remainder, that is going to be the exponent that stays underneath the radical. So we will still have some radicals and answers here. Ooh. And I look at 3 and I'm like, okay, those don't really look the same. But they are. Because taking the square root of something and having something to the 1 half power are the same thing. So even though they look different, I can do the same thing I've been doing on the first two to this one. So I'll multiply my coefficients. Oh, I don't have any other x's. But the y's, again, remember, when you're multiplying with variables, you're adding the exponents. So 2 plus 6 would be y to the 8. And now I go into breakdown mode. Crap, 75 isn't a perfect square. But, if I need my handy dandy chart, what in my squares column, if I want two numbers that multiply to 75, one of them has to be in the chart. <coughs> okay, 25 and 3. So I go, okay, square root of 25 is perfect. Gets out of radical jail, awesome. 3, not quite so much. Still acting irrationally, has to stay in radical jail. And then it's just the old long division game. Four goes in, oop, two goes into four twice, no remainder. Two goes into eight four times, no remainder. And I'm good. But again, that index, that root has to be the same for me to be able to keep fired along here. Division, no different. Simplify first. Okay, 54 divided by 6 is 9. Ooh. Now what happens with my exponents here when I'm dividing? You subtract them. You subtract them okay? So when I'm dividing, I'm going to, oops, let me get on the screen here. I'm going to subtract my exponents. So 4 minus 1 would give me x to the third. 6 minus 4 would give me y squared. Let's see. 9, OK, that breaks down nice. And then again, just play the long division game. 2 goes into 3 once, and I have 1 left over. 2 goes into 2 once, none left over. I'm set and ready to go. Now, are they always going to come out nice? No. I'll tell you now. Not always going to be nice. 5, 3, and 1 third. OK, they're the same. So I can go ahead and do all of my division here. So 108 divided by 2 is 54. Uh, I have no other a's, so a to the 15th. And 10, and I got minus 1 would give me b to the 9th. So now the a and b part's not going to be tricky at all, because 3 goes into 15 five times. 3 goes into 9 three times. Hmm, 54. 54, 54. Looking at my cubes line here. Which one of those numbers is a factor of 54? 27. So we have 27 and 2. 
And again, when you're dealing with cubes, so the cubed root of 27 is 3. That's perfect. That gets out. 2, however, not being perfect, has to stay under my cubed root. And having the index there matters. That root, with it being a 3, I need to have that. So let's see. Nothing's still awful here. Let's see what else we got. Now, sometimes, well, sometimes it's just not pretty. You're like, 8 doesn't go into 45. This doesn't reduce at all. It's true. So here I got to do them individually, and then I'll see at the end if there's something I happen to be able to do. We'll see. So that's a square root. Let's see. 8 is not a perfect square. So what's 8 going to break down into? 4 and 2. So I'm like, okay, so I've got 2, so that's the square root of 4. I've got a 2 left in here, and 2 goes into 2 once. That's a whole heap and a lot of 2s. Okay. And then I've got to do the same thing down in the denominator. What's 45 break down into? 9 and 5. So the square root of 9 is 3. The 5 stays underneath. And then 2 goes into 5 twice. And I have 1 left over, but I have an issue this time. Yeah, I can't have a radical in the denominator. Oh, boy. Okay, I'm going to cover this guy up because I'm going to use a little more room here. So to get rid of that radical in the denominator, because that's a no-no, I don't have to multiply by everything down there, just whatever the radical is. And if you've got to take some room up into number 7, that's okay. You're like, wow, this is a lot of stuff to keep track of here. Okay, so we've got 2x. These are both under a radical with the same root. So I can multiply them together. Here, I'm going, okay, so I've got 3y squared. If I multiply these together, it gives me 25y squared. But again, I'm taking the square root of that in a minute. So I got one last step. The top, I have to be content with. I can have a radical on the top. That's okay. Square root of 25 is 5. And then 2 goes into 2 once. So this is really 5y. And I just multiply those together. 3 times 5 is 15. 2y, and there's one more, gives me 3. I cannot reduce. That's under a radical. Can't reduce the y's, it's under a radical. That's as far as I can go on number six. Whew, hopefully there aren't a lot of those floating around because those get to be a little more interesting. It, it takes all the stuff that we've learned about and kind of keeps stacking it in here. And that's probably the trickiest thing of all of this because there's only a couple other minor things that we're gonna take care of down here below and everything else is pretty straightforward. So now, what we're going to do, let me move this up a little bit. You're like, oh, looks like we're foiling with this, and we are. So when we get into doing stuff with the foiling, and again, some of you may draw your lines with it, some of you may not need to, I just put them in. So here, a couple of things to keep track of. If you multiply two numbers of the same radical, you're going to get that number back. In other words, 11 times 11 is 121, but the square root of 121 is 11 anyway. So if you're looking for a shortcut, just if you see the same one, write down that number. You may also notice this is a difference because I've got plus 11 times 13 is 143. And then I've got minus the exact same thing, if you notice that. Don't bother with them. They're going to cancel out. And then minus, because it's negative times positive, the square root of 169 
is 13. Sometimes it'll clean up really, really nice. Other times, not so much. <coughs> because again, whenever I'm doing these, so here, same radical, so 2 squared of x times x, 2 times squared of x, excuse me, is 2x. And then I go, okay, so then I got the outside. Negative 4 times 2 squared of x would be negative 8 squared of x. 1 times the square root of x, it would be the square root of x. And then 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. And now I'm just going to look to see are there any like terms to put together, and they'll always be sitting there in the middle. Negative 8 plus 1 is negative 7. So they won't always just always reduce down to a number. Sometimes, got to work them out a little bit. So let's see. A little more distributing here. Now again, I notice. Square root of 7 and square root of 7. So that would just become regular 7. So 3 times 7 is 21. But not so lucky over here. 7 times 14 is the square root of 98. Don't be content. Can we break down 98? Yes. yes. What wonderful number from my new squares list goes into 98? 49 and 2. So I go, okay, 49 and 2. So I've got 21 minus 3. Square root of 49 is 7. 2 is still stuck. And I'm going to finish this. Three. And I'm not going to get sucked in into trying to say, oh, 21 minus 21 is 0. No. It has this radical with it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Oh, let's see here. I want to do one here and one there. All right, I got this. So what we're going to do, I'm going to leave this guy alone. I'm going to come down here. And we talked about before how I can't have a radical in the denominator. So well, what do you do when it's you know a binomial term, when I've got a plus or a minus in there? What I'm going to do down here is you switch the sign in the middle of what you're working with. So if you see plus, it becomes minus. If you see minus, it becomes plus. And let me explain how this works out for us. Because you might be looking at that and going, this is really going to get rid of the radical. It is, actually. Because if I look, up top I can distribute. So 4 times 3 is 12. 4 times negative square root of 2. OK. But then I foil this out. And I go, oh, I see how this is going to work. 3 times 3 is 9. When I do this, I get negative 3 square root of 2 and positive 3 square root of 2. They're going to cancel. So my O and my I in foil will always cancel. And then I look here, and it's positive times negative 2 times 2 is the square root of 4. Well, I know that's 2. And I'm like, oh, OK. So 12 minus 4 square root of 2. If this really just equals 2, 9 minus 2 is 7, and I'm OK. I'm like, oh, I see how this works. Same here. Distribute up top. <coughs> 12 plus 8 square root of 2. And then I go down below and I foil it. But really, I've only got to do the full part of foil. I don't need to do the oi. My first, 3 times 3 is 9. Positive 6 square root of 2. Negative 6 square root of 2. They cancel. Then I get to the end, and I've got minus 4 times the square root of 4, which again I know is 2. So I've got 12 plus 8 square root of 2. Then 
9, so 4 times 2, this is really 9 minus 8. And I can put the 1 or I could just circle what I have up top. And it's going to work the exact same way. So like I was mentioning when we first started this whole deal, we are going to work this guy. You're like, why is it all blank on the front? Because I wanted to be able to put the sheet on there and get the assignment on here together. So if that drives you crazy and you want to staple a piece of paper to it, that's fine. But this is the actual assignment that we're working on for this one. So in homework check five, this will be assignment number one. We'll call it book page this, or we can call it worksheet 12.5. And then the back is strictly extra credit. Okay, Extra credit puzzle, actual assignment over here. And we'll have a little time tomorrow to chat about this before we get into getting you the quiz preview and a little more of the 7-6 stuff.